If you were here last week, you had the privilege of hearing Josh Kelso preach. Wasn't that good to hear from Josh again? Get a little update on Gilbert Bible Church and the ministry there. We're so thrilled at what God is doing and so thankful to hear Josh open God's word. A number of us were gone. Uh, A number of us spent 10 days in Israel. And uh, it was an expositor seminary trip, that is, where... uh, It was kind of the inaugural trip uh, to uh, design the the path of students studying God's Word, being able to study the land and the people of the Word of God. And uh, just looking back at my own life, it, it seems like some sort of criminal negligence to have not made access of the resources of being in the land and seeing what we saw all these years, to be able to understand God's Word well. And, And we know that Um, God's word can be understood from what has been written, and yet there is a tremendous benefit to seeing the very places that are described, understanding the personages that are there. So uh, I'm only going to whet your appetite for what is to come. Uh, Omri Miles and Steve Kovac will be giving subsequent back-to-back Sunday night reports on our trip. So next Sunday night and the following Sunday night, Uh, If you're interested in seeing some pictures, hearing some stories, learning some lessons uh, from uh, from the five who went to Israel the past 10 days, I'd encourage you to be here those two Sunday nights for that. And in addition to uh, being a seminary trip, it was also a scouting trip uh, for future church trips from Grace Bible Church. So I'm not asking for volunteers now. Don't come forward. Don't sign anything. Don't buy plane tickets yet. Uh, But just know we are planning uh, some field trips from the church. This morning we're picking up where we've left off on our Caring for Each Other series. And Lord willing, we'll have two more after this week and then begin our verse-by-verse exposition of the book of Revelation beginning January 29th. And where we've been in the series, we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 and looked at our own part in the health and the growth of the church. We discovered from Hebrews 10 that we are, in fact, our brother's keepers. And from Galatians 6, that our heart must be one of restoration when we find one another in significant spiritual need. And that we must have a certain character governing our lives for the task of facing church challenges. This morning we'll be looking at Matthew 18, and we'll be looking at what it means to follow God's prescriptions for caring for one another with the realities of residual sin. We are needy people. We are in a mixed condition. We are not yet perfected. We are not as Christ is. We are not conformed completely to his image. We are not what we were. We are no longer slaves of sin, but we still have the residue of our depravity. And that affects how we interact with one another. It's inevitable in the body of Christ, if we're close enough to one another, that we will sin against one another. And that our sins, even if not directed against one another, will be known to each other. Again, we're not all that we should be. We need each other. You and I, in the body of Christ, have each other's backs. I want to read to you Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. This will be our text this morning. And this lays out the church discipline process, sometimes referred to as the Matthew 18 process, or the pursuit of prodigals, as some have called it. A particularly good description, if you consider Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, The father's disposition in that parable was one of joy and celebration at the son's return. This is a process not only for the purity of the church, for the elimination of hypocrisy in the church, but also for the restoration of sinners in the church. Look at God's word with me, Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins, go Show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. 
If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three, excuse me, if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. The process described here by the Lord Jesus is out of vogue in our day. Church discipline has gone out of style. Even parental discipline is out of style in our day. An unnatural view of tolerance has replaced love. In fact, the idea that a church would seek to address harmful behavior among its own members and even remove a person who is unwilling to change seems like some obsolete hangover from the Middle Ages. The church has become a place of consumerism where a church on a Sunday morning offers a product and consumers come in and decide whether or not they like that product. That, of course, is not the New Testament model of the church. If you think about the metaphors the New Testament gives to the church, a family, a flock, a building, a bride, and a body, it is not a place where consumers pick and choose what they like. Think about the the picture of of a family. You have brothers and sisters who are inextricably related to one another blood-bought and unified by their union to Jesus Christ. We have a heavenly Father, and we are a family. Think about the church as a flock. We are all sheep under the one shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow Him where He goes. We are identified by Him, cared for by Him, and together as a flock. The church is pictured as a building in the New Testament that is a corporate unity. There are individual parts, but they don't live up to their purpose unless they are together functioning. And the church is seen as a bride wedded to Christ, affectionate in her devotion to the Savior together corporately. And last, the church is pictured as a body An organism of interdependent, interconnected parts. When one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. We are to feel that. And though it may seem strange to the world that a process like Jesus describes here would be outlined, it ought not be strange to the church. I mean, if... If you've ever been asked to leave a movie theater because of some problem in your private life, that would be strange. Maybe a father who is impatient with his children at home uh, is suddenly walked out of a restaurant. You can't be a patron here if things in your home are out of sorts. That would be strange. What if you were not allowed to buy a vacuum cleaner on Amazon because of a seared conscience and an immoral lifestyle? Such things would be thought strange, and and I believe the world superimposes onto the church the sort of expectations, well, why can't people just be whatever they want to be and come to the church? Who, who, Who needs to get into their lives and meddle? And I believe the imposition of a consumer mindset onto the church provokes the idea in us that actual care, actual love, actual involvement in each other's lives is something that has no place. Many churches are unwilling to follow Jesus' instructions in this matter out of fear that people won't attend a church that actually addressed sin in its people. And you may remember the scene in Acts 5. Ananias and Sapphira had lied to the Holy Spirit, presented untruths before the church, and God dropped them. They were actually killed before the people. At the same time that Ananias and Sapphira were suddenly, catastrophically, by the Lord, removed from the church, the Lord added to the number of the church. Outsiders feared the world didn't want to be in the church. But people who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ came in droves, and the world held them in high esteem. 
It's just the opposite of what the marketeers of the church today think. How are we going to get people to stay if we talk about heavy things like sin, if we are involved in each other's lives? How often have you heard this criticism of the church? The church is just full of hypocrites. Why don't they clean up their own messes? And yet the world that demands the church clean up its act is actually horrified at the thought that the church would clean up its act. Here is Jesus' prescription for that very thing. Let me give you some reasons up front to actually practice church discipline. And the first one is just simply a love for people. A love for people. A love for people that Christ loves who may find themselves on a trajectory away from Christ. What would it be like to come across someone who is asleep in a burning building? What would love dictate? Well, I don't want to meddle in their personal business. Who am I to go in there and and wake them up? Nobody likes to be roused from sleep. But love demands that we actually care for one another when our lives are at stake in the entanglements of sin. Another reason to practice church discipline is a desire for restoration, for the joys of forgiveness, for the beauty of unity that comes through the blood of Christ and the grace of the gospel when there is a hardship that is then worked out and sinners confess and find unity and restoration and joy. And I hope in your close relationships, whether in home or in the church, you have experienced the beauty of restoration after confession and forgiveness. Another reason to practice church discipline is for the purity of the church. Paul indicted the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5 for not having removed the immoral brother, explaining that a little leaven leavens the whole batch. The results of not dealing with sin in the church are catastrophic for her witness for her purity. And a final reason to practice church discipline is simply because Jesus said to. These are prescriptions from him. There are consequences of a church not practicing this process. When we're not on short accounts with the Lord and with each other, the result is bitterness. A bitterness that a lack of confession and repentance produces. If we don't actually confess sin and then forgive one another freely when sins are confessed, then we just build up bitterness against one another. Hard feelings, distance, cold shoulders. Another consequence of a church not practicing church discipline is the taking out of personal vendettas or vengeance. If enough cold shoulder and bitterness and hardship builds up, we may just begin to treat each other unkindly. I've been treated unkindly, and my only recourse is to treat others unkindly. Another consequence of not practicing church discipline is license. We just get a green light to do whatever we'd like to do that displeases the Lord. When sin goes unchecked, it is contagious. The end of unchecked sin, of course, is apostasy, and that is a real danger and a consequence of a church not practicing church discipline. Someone in the church develops a hard heart, develops a coldness toward the Lord, stops reading God's word, stops spending time with the Lord in prayer, no longer keeps accounts with God over sin, and finds himself on a pathway of apostasy, which is the discovery of never having been a believer at all. Church discipline is actually one of God's means by which he keeps his own in the faith. And eventually everyone does what is right in their own eyes. The church loses its witness. The church loses its influence. The church loses its ability to be a lampstand for the gospel in the world. Cross-check the church at Thyatira in Revelation 2. They tolerated immorality in their midst. And they lose their witness. So Jesus gave to the church a process by which to pursue wayward Christians. That's all of us at one time or another, to one degree or another. 
And what we want to do this morning is to examine the practice of church discipline through the activities of three concerned parties. We'll spend most of our time this morning on your role, Christian, in the process of church discipline. But we will look beyond our individual roles and our corporate role as believers. We will look at heaven's role and Jesus' role. Let's look first at our role in this process. This is the church's procedure. It's found in verses 15 to 17 of Matthew 18. And it is interesting here that Jesus gives a procedure, a four-step process whereby we interact with one another regarding sin. When I was a flight student, I had to memorize the checklist for an engine failure of a Cessna 172 Skyhawk. That airplane only has one engine. So when that engine fails, there are things you have to do. And the the procedure is very simple and straightforward. Step number one, establish maximum glide. That is, you fly the airplane at 65 knots, and you trim the airplane so that it kind of flies itself. You can let go with your hands, take care of other things, and that airplane will glide at its maximum glide rate, which if you start at 8,000 feet, you can actually glide with no engine for about 12 miles. That gives you a lot of time and a lot of space to figure out what to do next. So first step is maximum glide. Your second step is to look around, look outside the windows, pick somewhere to put the airplane down. Choose a field, plan an approach. Third step is attempt to restart the engine. You check the fuel selector, you check your fuel air mixture, you check to make sure your carb heat was on or off as appropriate, you check your throttle, the ignition, and the primer. Step number four, you communicate, you tell somebody out there, hey, I've lost an engine, I'm going down, here's my general location. And step number five on the checklist is literally check the checklist. Read these steps. And you read them and you say it out loud. In just about every training flight I ever had, some instructor would be trying to distract you, make you look outside the window. Hey, look at that river down there. And he'd pull the throttle on you. He'd simulate an engine failure. And then you have to go, oh, what am I supposed to do? And you get flabbergasted and you panic and you figure, oh, what am I? Ah. Oh, that's right. There's a checklist. Pull it, it's right there, it's right there by your left hand, right in the door, little pocket of the airplane. You pull it out and you read it and you just say, okay, what do I do? Oh, that's right, set up the glider. (laughs) Try to restart the engine, plan an approach. You, You go through all the steps and the fifth step on the step is read the steps. Christians, sometimes in the midst of difficulty in the body of Christ, when there is crisis, We can panic and do all the wrong things. Jesus has very kindly given us a procedure, a checklist. And if a procedure sounds to you somehow cold, clinical, impersonal, you need to understand that this is grace, simple, clear instructions in a time of crisis. It's actually very helpful. If you're experiencing a medical emergency and serious trauma, you want people on the scene who follow the instructions rather than people who are overwhelmed and unable to help. This simple procedure removes the blindness and the temporal distortion caused by emotions in a traumatic situation. Following these steps keeps us from making it up as we go. It protects us from taking revenge. It protects us from vindictiveness or self-protection or partiality. Notice, first of all, that these instructions come from Jesus. We can simply dispense with the idea that Jesus would never do something like this. No, this procedure for the church is exactly what Jesus would tell us to do when a brother sins. It is, in fact, what he did tell us to do. When a brother sins. And keeping this in mind will bring tremendous comfort when we have to go about the difficult task of addressing sin in each other's lives. There are four steps given here, each with the goal of restoring a straying brother. And I'll list the steps these way. I have borrowed these labels. They are private reproof, private conference, public announcement, and public exclusion. Let's start with the private reproof. This is step one. It's found in verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, 
you have won your brother. This is not about personal offenses. If you drop down to verse 21, Peter is going to ask the question, uh, when somebody sins against me, how many times do I have to forgive them? And that is an important passage on forgiveness of personal offenses. And a Christian can overlook personal offenses. You can cover them in love, 1 Peter 4, 8. And the command there is to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And that doesn't exclude addressing them. But what's in view here in this church discipline process is not necessarily personal offenses against me, but sins in my brother's life that prove harmful to him and to the church. This is sin in general. No specific sin is specified. In fact, there is no list in Scripture of the types of sin that should be addressed in the church discipline process. Any sin left unchecked is a danger to the Christian and to the church. Unchecked sin hardens the heart, brings disunity, and is on that trajectory toward apostasy, a walking away from Christ altogether. Immorality, false teaching, anger, drunkenness, gossip, whatever it is, anything the Bible calls sin. And as we will see, the issue here is truly the condition of the heart. Uh, the sin is the thing on the surface. But a recalcitrance about sin, an unwillingness to turn from it, an unwillingness to repent when it is exposed or addressed, that is the hard issue that leads one away from Christ altogether. Notice your brother, verse 15. This indicates our family relationship together. It also indicates our responsibility. I am my brother's keeper. This is the responsibility of brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church. It is not merely the task of church leaders. And notice Jesus says, if your brother sins, the word sin is important here. It's not a preference. Not If your brother does something you just don't like. If your brother does something a different way than you would, if, if the way your brother draws out important principles in some way is different than yours, that's not the category here. The category here is sin, not some personal habit you don't like. It must be a biblically definable category of sin. And notice Jesus says, if your brother sins, that is uh, present, ongoing, unbroken sin. Look, all, all of us sin. All of us have sinned and we will sin. But, but what Jesus has in view here is an unbroken pattern of an unturned away from sin. If your brother is sinning, a sin that's held on to and not forsaken, here's the command. Go and show him his fault. Literally, go and reprove him. To reprove means to make, a, make him aware of something that is wrong. The caring brother takes the initiative out of love and compassion and concern and shows him his wrong. This takes great courage. It takes great courage to do this in obedience to Jesus' command, to do this in love, to do this without hypocrisy. It takes great courage. When a brother or sister comes to you and wants to help point something out, just recognize, friend, oh, that took great courage. It must have been hard for you to come to me and, and point out my blind spot. Thank you ought to be our response. This is not easy to do. Oh, it is easy to just run around and point out everybody else's faults. That, that's not this process. Any fool can be a bull in a china shop and, and just break things down and, and, and try to build self up by putting others down and, and just be a fault finder. Anybody can do that. But to truly take on this process with Jesus' heart, with a heart for restoration, with love for your brother, and with everything that it demands, the things we've talked about from Galatians 6.1 and 2 Timothy 2, a heart of restoration and, and a, a character development. Boy, this takes courage. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 5, take the log out of your eye so that you will see clearly to remove the speck. Look, if your brother has a painful shard in his eye, it's not love to just let him go because, hey, I got stuff in my eye too. You just deal with your own stuff. 
he needs the precision care of an eye surgeon who can get in there and carefully remove a, a splinter or a, or a metal shard that's bringing about irritation in the eye and, and potential blindness. You need someone with compassionate care and skill. An eye surgeon, by the way, who has a redwood forest growing out the front of his face. And every time he turns around, he's trying to see that speck in your eye, and he's knocking you over with the lumber that's projecting from his forehead. That's not a good help. Jesus said, take the log, the beam, out of your eye so that you will be able to see clearly and help your brother. Merely pointing out faults while you've got the same faults growing out the front of your face is no help. Take the log out and help your brother. We looked at this in Galatians 6.1. If one is caught, have compassion. Go with the heart of love and, and help extricate your brother from the steel bear trap that is the sin that got him caught. And Jesus says, do this in private. This is so important. Go to your brother. Reprove him in private. That's not our first impulse, is it? We, we would rather broadcast. I could feel better about myself if everybody else thinks that guy is no good. Go to your brother in private. If you have a heart of love and a heart of compassion, this is so important. It's not shared as a church announcement. It's not lifted up to others as a prayer request. This is person-to-person, -person, private confrontation. And notice what Jesus says. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. To listen here is to hear and to heed, to give up sin, to actually turn. And what is the goal? Restoration, winning your brother. It's a gain. It's a win. Think of the father of the prodigal son who felt as if he had gotten his own child back from the dead. Listen, if step one is successful, the goal is restoration, the motive is love, and the process is over. The sin confessed, turned from, remains private, and the result is rejoicing. Look up at verse 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone away, does he not leave the 99 in the mountains and go and search for the one? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 who have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. There's rejoicing. Now, when do we carry out this step one? I believe this step one happens in the body of Christ all the time. It doesn't have to come with a banner. It doesn't come with an, amount, an announcement uh, to go reprove your brother in private, to go ask about a blind spot, to go try to help a brother get a speck out of his eye. It does not have to come with, hey, this is step one, buddy. I'm telling you right now. This is just the normal warp and woof of life in the body of Christ. Uh, why don't we hear about it all the time? Because it's private. Little corrections, admonish one another, staying on short accounts. We sin, we recognize it, we confess it, and we turn. It's called parenting. It's called marriage. It's called small group. It's called life in the body of Christ. This is daily life together. We all have blind spots. We all have the ability to be hard-hearted, defensive, slow to turn from sin. We need each other. We need to be in each other's lives. We need to know of each other's needs. We need to have each other's backs. Step one does not always work. There's no guarantee that if we follow the procedure in verse 15, that a sinning brother will turn. And so verse 16 gives a second step. We move from private reproof to private conference. Look at verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Sometimes this involves more than just you going to your brother. The church discipline process cannot be carried out by one person. A church leader cannot excommunicate an enemy. A Christian is not able to remove someone from fellowship all by himself. An accusation is not valid simply because it is made. 
We do have an example in Scripture of a sinful, self-absorbed man who actually excommunicated people all by himself. His name is Diotrephes. He's exposed in 3 John. And the Apostle John writes about him. He says, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will draw attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. Not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren, and he forbids those who desire to do so, and he puts them out of the church. Here is one man excommunicating people from the church without Jesus' process. That's sin. You can't do this on your own. By the way, step two, the two or three, does not happen immediately following the first attempt at step one. Just think about this for a moment, Christian. When someone has tried to help you see a blind spot in your, in your life, did your best response come as your first response? Do you notice in your own heart a, a defensiveness, a, a temptation towards blame shifting, uh, maybe writing things off? No, it, 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 this doesn't need to be addressed. Hey, why are you bothering me? I feel all those things in my own heart. So when we go to someone else, should we have the lofty expectation that they will respond perfectly to a difficult conversation the moment we bring it to their attention? I think that's an unrealistic, unloving expectation. Don't assume that step one, one conversation, now step two, I'm bringing two or three. Oftentimes in the body of Christ, step one is multiple conversations, multiple opportunities but when a brother does not listen, we bring two or three. There are some sins which threaten others that require more speedy procedures, but where we can, slow, deliberate, patient, prayerful, hopeful step one may bring us to a step two in verse 16. Again, this is gracious process from Jesus for the restoration of a sinning brother, to take two or three in addition to yourself. And Jesus gives this purpose, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Listen, these two or three witnesses, they do not have to be witnesses to the original offense. This is not a trial. They are witnesses to the reproof given by the one and the response given by the sinning brother. In fact, they're there to actually give testimony to this is, in fact, thoughtful, patient, genuine, loving reproof given for an actual unforsaken sin. What if it's not? What if I go to a brother in the church and I just don't like the color socks he's wearing or the football team he follows and I try to take up a case against him? And two or three... Come with me to go address the brother who will not turn. <laughs> They're not going to condemn him. They're going to say, Smed, what are you doing? That's not a biblical sin category. That was not done out of love. That was just selfish. They're going to help me see my blind spot. This is a protection against false accusations, personal attacks, and it is there to help demonstrate the heart of the person who will not turn from their sin. So while examining every fact, the two or three are there to say, is this actually sin? Is this being done according to Jesus' process? And if so, what's on display in the sinning brother who will not let go of his sin? Oh, we see that hard heart too. By the way, Jesus hearkens back here to Mosaic law. Uh, an actual quotation from the Old Testament as a protection against false witness. And even when this is done well and done according to Jesus' script, it does not always work. That leads to a third step. It's in the first half of verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. We could label this step public announcement. This is a public announcement to the church, to the gathered body of believers. This can be to a segment of the church. This can be carried out with the elders, with a small group, with a ministry where that individual is involved. 
It may eventually lead to a, an announcement to the whole church gathered. Often at Grace Bible Church, we carry this out in stages of telling it to the church in ever-widening circles. The desire here is to be slow, methodical, patient, thorough, and giving every opportunity for a soft landing for a repentant brother. The one brings attention to an area of sin. The few bring attention to that same area of sin. And now the church is enlisted. And the effect of the widening circle of exposure is the demonstration of a heart attitude in the one who will not forsake sin. The goal here in step three is still restoration, unity, and fellowship. But the unrepentant one demonstrates that he would rather cling to his sin than to his family his spiritual family, the church. He has rejected the loving admonition of the one. He has refused the loving conference of the few. And now the church is informed so that the church may collectively pursue him in love. And that is the goal. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, what does that imply? That means the church together is pursuing the sinning brother in love. With the same character, the same heart of compassion described for the one and the few. And what's on display in the rejection of the admonition in these widening circles is a hard heart. The trajectory of apostasy. Listen to Hebrews 3. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Listen, a church that is content with someone in our midst to be deceived by sin and to be hard-hearted and to fall away from the living God. A church that is content with that is not a church governed by love. That is a church marked by indifference, a lack of love, profound Eternal lack of love. Listen, there is hope for the hard-hearted found in Jesus' instructions. Perhaps he will listen to the church. But if not, there is a fourth step, second half of verse 17. If he refuses to listen even to the church, Jesus says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This fourth step is a step of public exclusion public exclusion. Let him be a Gentile. In this context, Jesus speaking to his Jewish disciples at that time, that was to be a rank outsider. That is not a God-fearer, a Gentile who has adhered to Yahweh, the God of Israel, but a Gentile, an absolute outsider. Treat him as one who does not belong in this community. And he is to be treated as a tax collector. And a tax collector in Jesus' day was an insider who became an outsider, a Benedict Arnold, a traitor to the nation. The tax collectors in Israel in those days were those who served the Roman Empire, who had Israel under the thumb, by taking money from their own countrymen to give it to the Romans. They were seen by Israelites as the worst of traitors, the lowest of the low, and they had accumulated around themselves the low-life scum of society. By the way, the author of the book of Matthew, a tax collector, takes an autobiographical shot here. He knew what it was like personally to be on the outs with the nation. Jesus' words here would be significant. This is a command from Jesus, by the way, this process to now treat one who professed faith in Christ and was part of this family, part of this building, part of this bride, part of this flock, part of this body, to then treat them as an outsider. And this process, although painful in what it reveals, is not optional, and we cannot confuse what is hard with what is right. You can't say, oh, this is so difficult, it must therefore not be the right process. 
And listen, I understand when, when this process is laid out in, in a hypothetical four-step procedure, that's one thing. But when this process has a name and a face to it, because it's someone that we know, someone that we've loved, someone with whose life our own lives have been enmeshed, this becomes very challenging. And the task in that turmoil, the task in that tumult is to get the checklist, get the procedure, read the steps again. Listen, every church discipline process that I've been involved with has been different. It's had nuance. They've all been distinct. There are no two alike. And the elders of the church have had to get out Matthew 18, turn to it. I guarantee you the, the pastors of the church could recite these steps from memory, and yet every single time we're involved in a process like this, we open our Bibles and we read it again slowly and carefully because it's hard. It's hard. And our comfort is in following Jesus' procedures. His is a procedure of love whose goal is restoration. Now, the goal here in step four is still restoration. It's still hopeful. The command here to treat them like an outsider is not a prohibition of all contact but it is a removal from fellowship, from the benefits of being a part of the body of Christ while denying with your deeds what you say you believe. There can be no real fellowship with someone who has hard-heartedly rejected all that a believer holds dear. You see, the unrepentant one has successively removed layers of the church from his own life, and this is what sin does. Sin is isolating. You have to remove yourself from relationships to hold on to your sin. And you're willing to break those relationships because you love sin more. It is true that there is a removal of the unrepentant so-called brother from fellowship at this point. But in a very real sense, that brother has long ago removed the church from his own life. Listen to the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Sin demands a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen even in the midst of a pious community. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. The sin is brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden is made manifest. It is a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted. But God breaks the gates of brass and bars of iron. Sin wants you alone. Does the person whose sin is being addressed like the procedure? Not often. Do you like to be woken up in the middle of a deep sleep? What about when your house is on fire? I've never been a part of a church discipline process where people did not complain about the process. You didn't have to use cold water. You didn't have to raise your voice. You, you didn't have to come in and, and rip my blankets off my bed while my house was burning down around me. I hope you see the wisdom and the love of Jesus and the simple, clear procedure he's given to his followers. Listen, it would be tacitly unbiblical to be indifferent, to be cold-hearted towards your brother. It would be unbiblical to be condescending towards your brother, to think you're holier than he, to think you're above what he has found himself in. It would be sinful to be self-righteous. It would be sinful to be cowardly and not do what Jesus demands. It would be wrong to promote some sort of a false love, a sentimentality that defines love as, oh, we're just going to let everybody do what they want to do. Not to meddle in personal business. It would be sinful to reject this process and replace it with vindictiveness or revenge. 
It would be sinful to deflect from our own sin by pointing out others' sin and hypocrisy. And it's a rank hypocrisy to tell the world they need to repent, but for us to refuse to do so collectively as a body of Christ. Neglect of this duty is not love. Any more than neglecting the discipline of your own children would be love. Listen to Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. Listen, that is, that is a pointed parallel. Discipline your son while there's hope. Don't desire his death. Those are two ways of saying the same thing. If you fail to discipline your son, you are in a sense desiring his demise. And that same principle holds true in the church. Sin is dangerous. The trajectory of sin is eternally costly. One has said, well, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you are willing to pay. When we sin, we, we, we buy into the unbelief and the deception of sin. We think perhaps that we can manage sin. When in the reality, sin's insidious desire is to get a foothold and destroy everything that is precious to you. So the loving thing to do is help a brother or sister become disentangled from the deception and the death that sin brings. I've been talking to you this morning about a four-step process. There is an unstated step five of the church discipline process. It is implied in it if you've won your brother. The hope of winning your brother does not end at step four. Step five would be a reconciliation where the church would welcome the repentant brother back. We will talk about that at length next week. I want you to observe the Matthew 18 sandwich. If you were to read all of Matthew chapter 18, you'd discover in the first five verses that you have to be humble like a child to get in to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You have to be humble like a child. And in verses 6 through 10, Jesus gives the command to remove stumbling blocks that, God, that causes God's children to stumble. Woe to the stumbling blocks. Stumbling blocks are dangerous. They're bad. God doesn't like them. They're harmful to his children. Verses 12 to 14, we read it already. It is, the implication there is to pursue the prodigal sheep and rejoice when they're brought back. Verses 15 to 20 give the discipline process. And then the rest of the chapter is an answer to Peter's question. So when some guy sins against me personally, what do I do? And Jesus gives the parable about the money lenders and impresses upon us the fact that we must have a heart ready to forgive. And if you do not have a forgiving heart, you have no place enjoying the benefits of God's forgiveness of you. Forgiven people forgive freely and readily. That is the sandwich of Matthew 18 in which this process finds itself. Humility, purity, love, discipline, and forgiveness, they all go together in this plan that Jesus has laid out. That is our role, Christian, in this process. Caring for one another in the body of Christ and caring for one another when sin rears its ugly head. There are two other parties to this process and, and we want to look at those briefly. In verse 18, we see heaven's endorsement. This is such a comfort. Jesus says there in Matthew 18, 18, Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is in this context of church discipline. It is the application of this process of church discipline. It gives a remarkable truth. It is a window into heaven for disciples who are tempted to grow weary in doing good. I mean, who wants to call a brother an outsider? Who has the stomach for treating someone you love as a tax collector or a Gentile? And this text is so helpful. Whatever you bind in this four-step process shall have been bound in heaven. 
This is unusual grammar. We don't often say shall have been anything. It's a future perfect tense in the English. It's rare. It's rare in the Greek New Testament as well. In fact, only the Holman Christian Standard and the New American Standard have it correct in the English. These are future perfects, and it's critically important. If you don't care about grammar, just listen to this. What we do here in this process does not bend heaven's will to our process. Rather, the process, when carried out according to Jesus' instructions, simply reveals here what only heaven could know. In fact, what heaven already knows. What you bind here shall already have been bound in heaven. You see, this process, designed by the Lord of the church, effectively reveals what only the Lord could know, the condition of the human heart. We don't know hearts. We don't read hearts. We don't have a soul x-ray machine. And yet we follow this process, trusting the Lord of the church, and he puts on display what he already knew. This truly is the Lord's discipline. Listen to Proverbs 3. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. This is the Lord's process for the Lord's people. And this is a great comfort for us in a difficult process. Besides the church's involvement and heaven's endorsement, there is a third party to this process, and it is Jesus' special presence. It's put on display here in verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, again, I said to you, if two, or you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst." This is not a general statement about prayer meetings, as if Jesus isn't present with you when you're praying on your own. Well, prayer only counts if there's two or three. No, this is the two or three listed in this passage about church discipline. And it is Jesus' promise of immediate proximity, special presence, his omnipresence and special location with you in this process. Now, we know that Jesus is bodily located in heaven at the right hand of the Father, advocating on behalf of believers. That is his zip code currently. But Jesus, as God, is also infinite and omnipresent all the time by the word of his power, sustaining the created order all the time. He is everywhere, every when he is present. But Jesus has articulated his special presence and endorsement in this process right where we need it. And the presence of God in scripture also almost or often brings comfort, assistance, guidance, and protection. And this is critical for the for the one who addresses a brother, for the two or three who need to be involved in a difficult process, for the church who brings to public announcement or public exclusion. Can you imagine what it would have been like to try to address Ananias and Sapphira? Hey, Ananias, I, I know you didn't sell the land for what you said you sold it for. Um, can I ask you about why you're trying to deceive everybody? Are you trying to look as generous and as cool as Barnabas, who gave 100% of proceeds for the land that he sold for the needs of the church? Do you want other people to esteem you like they esteem him? Is that what's going on here? Can I ask you about that? We need help. Those are difficult, hard conversations. What would it be like to be stiff-armed in a conversation like that? No, you don't know what you're talking about. Stay out of my business. And you've got to bring two or three with you. How hard would that be? We need Jesus' presence, his comfort, his endorsement, his assistance. The opposite of this compromises the church's integrity, cripples the church's witness, dishonors the church's Lord, and fails to love the Lord's people. I know this is a difficult passage. There is a series of messages on this topic and this practice on our church website. Uh, you can look up any number of sermons from various pastors in this church over the years. Just in the little search bar, type Matthew 18. If you find yourself in a situation where you want help 
either in understanding this process or how it works, or you find yourself in part of this process, please don't hesitate to speak with one of the pastors. I want to close our time this morning just thinking about sin. Sin entered the world through one man, and death entered through sin. Death spread to all men. On account of our spiritual death, all of us sin. There is only one hope for sinners. And it is what Ashley brought to us from Hebrews during our communion meditation this morning. That a perfect sacrifice by Jesus the Messiah, once for all time, perfects all who are being sanctified. What good news is that? That believers in Jesus Christ are still in the process of being shaped being reproved, being won over and softened, being corralled, being helped. In our weakness, we still sin. And yet over us is this declaration of perfection, not on the basis of our cleaning ourselves up, not on the basis of our even doing a process like this well, but a declaration of perfect righteousness that meets God's perfect standard through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're aware of sin in your own life, let me just stop right there. If you're not aware of sin in your own life, you're a liar. But if you're aware of sin in your own life right now and you know you need a Savior, come to Jesus Christ. Come to Him and experience the forgiveness that He purchased with His own blood. Forgiveness for every sin, past and present and future. A forgiveness that will qualify you to be in God's glorious presence and not be incinerated by it, but stand blameless with great joy. And join the mess of sinners here who have been saved by His grace and, and are forgiven and are being sanctified. There will be friends here over by the door after we sing one more song who are ready to pray with you if you have spiritual needs of any sort. But if you know you need a Savior and you want to place your faith in Jesus Christ and be given eternal life, come meet with our friends over here and learn about the Lord. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for time in your word, time in... Uh, difficult concept and yet one which you have provided in your grace and your love and in your perfect wisdom. We pray that we would trust you implicitly. Surely we have learned from ourselves how untrustworthy our thoughts are when we make up our own script and go our own way and come up with our own plans. There is a way that seems right to a man, the end of it is death. But you, O oh Lord, are perfect in your ways. You are good and you do good and you prescribe good for us. May we trust in you. And now may we sing to you with full hearts in gratitude for all you've done in Jesus' name.